Anybody who knows me knows that I'm not into thanking Democrats. I'm not into Democrats. But I think we owe these Democrats our thanks. According to pollster Scott Rasmussen, 61% of Americans believe that tax cuts help the economy. Are we thanking the Democrats for that? 59% believe that tax cuts are a better job creation tool than government spending. 59% believe that higher deficits hurt the economy. 83% blame the deficit on the unwillingness of politicians to cut spending. Three quarters of Americans dislike Congress. 63 believe the country would be better if most of Congress was not reelected. 44% believe that their representative is not the best person for the job, and another 29% are not sure. We've always hated Congress and liked our guy. Now we don't so much like our guy. So why do we owe these Democrats our thanks? We've accumulated more debt in nine months in office than in all previous administrations since George Washington combined. We have the $787 billion stimulus bill that didn't stimulate. We have bailouts of companies that I think should have been allowed to reorganize through bankruptcy. That's why it exists. We have the cynical attempt to radically change the delivery of health care with next to no public review or no public input. We've had an attempt to place massive taxes on energy, the fundamental input to all economic output. We've had the attempt to make it nearly impossible for employers to resist union organization. The president has proposed a $3.83 trillion federal budget for fiscal year 2011, a budget that yields a $1.6 trillion deficit. And then there's just the general hostility to wealth and wealth creation, even though all three of these Democrats are themselves wealthy. Why is it that we owe these Democrats our thanks? Very simple. America is now paying attention. What is it about America that changed the world 250 years ago? Americans were allowed to own the property upon which they lived. In Europe, it didn't work that way. You farmed somebody else's land. When you farmed the land, you kept enough to keep yourself barely alive, and you handed all the rest off to the landlord, which is where that word comes from. That all led to the taking root of capitalism on the North American continent, and it was transformative. And it brought about the vast improvement in circumstances that had eluded humans for the first 49,750 years of human history. The role of government was very, very clearly defined and very clearly limited. The first role of government is defend the peace. Simply keep the bad guys from moving in. That is an essential role of government, and it was defined in our Constitution. A second role of government, support the currency. There has to be a medium of exchange between producers and buyers. It's the government's job to support the currency through sound fiscal management. And then act as an impartial referee. Don't be a player. Be the referee. If you're the government, be an impartial referee so that the game is played fairly, so that somebody who comes to the marketplace knows that he or she will be treated fairly in the conduct of commerce. That's the essential role of government. It was very clearly defined in our Constitution, and it sought to very clearly limit the role of government. The ink was not dry on the Constitution, and they were already afraid the government was too powerful. At the urging of James Madison, 12 amendments were proposed to the Constitution. Ten of them were ratified and became enshrined as the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights tells the government what it can't do to us more than telling us what we can do. It seeks to limit the intrusion of government into our lives. I went to the annual meeting of Berkshire Hathaway, the uh, company that's headed by legendary investor Warren Buffett. At that meeting was a member of the board of directors of Berkshire Hathaway. His name is Bill Gates, two of the richest men in the world. They are enormously influential in business, but they don't have power that I don't willingly give to them. I use PCs running the Microsoft Windows operating system, but I don't have to. I can use a Mac if I so choose. Geico is a company that is owned by Berkshire Hathaway. However, I have my cars insured through State Farm. Seize Candies, a company owned by Berkshire Hathaway. My daughter and I have agreed that we like Russell Stover candy better. Fruit of the Loom is a company owned by Berkshire Hathaway. Maybe more than you want to know, but I'm wearing a pair of jockeys at the moment. Benjamin Moore Paints, a company owned by Berkshire Hathaway. My wife and I recently redid our home. We painted the interior using bear paint. For as powerful as Warren Buffett is, he has no power that I don't willingly give him. And in the case of these companies, I've given him no power over me. It's the lady at the DPS that's powerful. She has power over your life. I went to renew my driver's license in September of 2009. I waited an hour and 37 minutes to renew my driver's license. It took me five weeks to receive it in the mail. I was in Rome in 2005, got my pocket picked. No money, no driver's license, no credit cards, 
I had nothing. Called up American Express. They had replacement personal and company cards in my hands in less than two hours. Takes the government of the state of Texas five weeks to mail out a driver's license. What that's telling you is very simple. American Express has to compete. If they can't take care of me, Visa is everywhere I want to be. Meanwhile, the driver's license lady, she knows I can't take my business someplace else. It's the postal worker that's powerful. There's the sign on the stamp machine saying out of service. Interesting thing, a lady named Pam, who's obviously frustrated, wrote on the sign, fix the stamps, please, it's been two months. The only question about that sign is, how long had it been since Pam wrote the thing on there about two months? By the time I found the thing, it could have been up there for four months. Meanwhile, in a stunning clash of cultures, outside that post office is a Federal Express collection box. That box is visited for five harried minutes, five days a week, by a FedEx driver, and yet he is able to replenish all the shipping supplies. He's able to collect the day's packages, and then he is able to put them into a system that delivers them with an accuracy exceeding 99%. Meanwhile, postal workers who work in the building eight hours a day every day can't replenish the stamps in over two months. It's the postal worker that's powerful. It's not Warren Buffett. It's not the rich. We all accept these petty little tyrannies of government, except for the fact that the tyrannies are becoming less petty. You see this picture in the DPS window. Imagine that kind of a scenario when I say here, take a number and we'll call you when your cancer is stage four. Imagine having to go through the same kind of bureaucracy in order to get health care when you have a terminal disease. Imagine having to go through that same kind of bureaucracy with respect to selling your house. Your waxman Markey Climate Change Act Home Energy Certificate will be completed in 8 to 12 weeks because they propose that we have to get our homes certified in order to sell them under proposed legislation, which means you have to go through a government bureaucracy in order to transact the business of selling your own private property. Do you remember $4 gasoline? It's coming again. Get receded because we're in a worldwide recession. Demand for energy is down. But meanwhile, we can't drill for oil in the United States because the government won't let willing producers go out and drill for oil. This is the Daisy Bradford number no. 3. It's a famous oil well. It was brought in on September 3, 1930. It continues to produce to this day. It sits on a beautiful little piece of property in East Texas. It opened up the largest oil field ever discovered in the world. In World War II, they buried a pipeline from Longview, Texas to Linden, New Jersey to power a mechanized effort in World War II. That big inch pipeline from Longview to Linden, New Jersey is still in use today, hauling natural gas. The area that leads to the Daisy Bradford No. 3 is covered in trees and it's literally very beautiful. And yet John McCain and other politicians won't let us drill in the most remote part of the most remote state in the Union. Oil is a naturally occurring product of the earth. It's not a pollutant. The earth makes it. At $150 a barrel, which is where it peaked in 2008, it's still the cheapest, most portable form of energy on earth. There is no economical alternative to it yet. Our global competitors will keep using it, and any alternative to oil will be market-driven. It won't be as a result of some Manhattan project or a man-on-the-moon project. It will be market-driven. Marginal increase in the world's supply that we could produce will have a profound impact on the price that we pay. Refusing to drill domestically because you're afraid of environmental damage effectively exports environmental damage, and that's because those that drill in the Middle East and in Russia and in Venezuela are less fastidious about how they drill than we in America are. We don't drill here, they'll drill there, and they'll do more damage to the earth than if we drilled here. And here's the thing that's most interesting. When you run up the price of energy, it's low-income households that are the first to be punished. $4 a gallon gasoline affects somebody who's getting by on minimum wage much more profoundly than it does someone who's making more money has higher household income. In 2008, at the peak of oil prices, more than half of Americans said they wanted to increase domestic oil exploration. And except for President Bush lifting an executive order regarding offshore drilling, the U.S. government continues to stifle domestic oil production, even though oil producers are willing to risk their own money to go produce oil. When the will of the majority is ignored, what you have is tyranny. We are deleveraging because we recognize that we were too deeply in debt. Borrowing to buy a house or pay for college is a defensible use of borrowing. But when you're having to borrow to pay the water bill, it means you're in trouble. And that's exactly what the U.S. government is doing. America is too big to fail, and this stuff matters. So forward this video to your friends. Click where it says share. Post your comments right here below. Thanks to our sponsor, Tyler Ford, and thanks to the Ford Motor Company, building cutting-edge, technologically advanced cars right here in the United States without a dime of taxpayer money.